the crisis within the international system worsens, nation states are competing, global cooperation is declining, and military expenditures are rising. The growing anger is fueling movements that embrace anti-globalization, protectionism and populism with consequences like Brexit, escalating trade conflicts and the U.S. withdrawal from the Paris Climate Agreement. However, in recent days, powerful voices at, at both the Paris Peace Forum and the BRICS Summit in Brussels have pushed back against these trends and reaffirmed the importance of multilateralism. Can such efforts help minimize the tensions and stabilize the world order? In the first part of the program, I'm happy to be joined by Mr. Pascal Lamy, the former Director General of the World Trade Organization and President of the Paris Peace Forum. When we come back in the second half, I'll be delighted to be joined here by Mr. Jean-Pierre Raffarin, former Prime Minister of France. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Yang Ray. Welcome to Dialogue, Mr. Pascolani. Uh, first of all, we, we would love to know the implications of the theme for this peace forum here in Paris. What do you want to achieve through a gathering as such? Well, our starting point is that the international system is not doing well, that the traditional approach to international cooperation is in crisis. So what we're trying to do is not replace the existing system, which is based on sovereigns, treaties, organizations, institutions, but to supplement it through initiatives by non-state actors, cities, businesses, civil society organizations, big academic institutions that are willing to address global problems through specific coalitions. So it's a sort of solution-based bottom-up approach instead of a top-down diplomatic approach. It seems all you have said is more or less related to development, um, economic growth, but why is this forum called Peace Forum? Because uh, uh, this reminds me of the theme of the United Nations during the Cold War when the issue of peace was very much prioritized uh, ahead of development. So Kofi Annan, former chief of UN, started to prioritize a millennium development goal to alleviate poverty. Uh, let me know your thoughts on the differences between peace and development. My own view, for what it's worth, is that where we have wars is the result of tensions which very often are economic and social tensions. Of course, there are also ideological or religious tensions, but in most of the places of this planet, where you look at where people are the most in war, where the largest antagonisms develop, is grounded on economic and social hardship, is grounded on problems which some humans have and which are not solved. And as a result of that, this translates into violence, antagonisms, conflicts. So solving problems is a way to build peace. And we are in the solving problem business. Mr. Lamy, uh, your track record is very impressive. Uh, you engineered China's entry into the WTO in the year 2001, and you were um, chairman of this uh, Paris Peace Forum, a PPF. Now, tell me why the issue of a global governance proves so important in the broad context of a, a rising unilateralism as opposed to multilateralism. I mean, these issues threaten to divide the world very seriously. I think you're right. We are in a situation where global governance translated as multilateral governance. There are different ways of global governance. A hegemon is a global governance. A duopoly is a global governance. What we are looking for is a multilateral, multipolar governance. It's in danger at this moment. As globalization moves on, we have more and more global problems, but our capacity to address them 
is not what it should be, especially when it is under attack, like, for instance, by the U.S., under a theme which is anti-multilateralism. My country first is exactly the contrary of international cooperation and multilateralism. So we have this problem. My own view is that if you take the example of the U.S., but it's also true for Turkey, for Brazil, for the Philippines, where we have leaders of a new kind for whom international cooperation is not what it used to be for their predecessors. The reason for that is in the domestic problems of these countries. It's exactly uh, the next question I'm going to focus on. For example, do you believe that democracy is both a solution and a problem? Uh, because the rise of unilateralism and protectionism, particularly populism, is based on the platform of a, you know, nationalistic sentiment, um, be it Brexit or the rise of uh, Trump's presidency on the platform of unilateralism. So it seems the use of ballot box may not necessarily spell a golden era for domestic politics or economic growth of individual country or a major economy. You cannot expect with the luxury that every individual who cast their vote will be reasonable, uh, rational, and ready to argue, to debate. They would rather use sentiments instead of reasoning, instead of using their mind. This is something that has puzzled the Chinese. No, I can, I can understand that, and I know that China and more largely Asian ideologies, religions, visions of the world, what makes people understand what's good, what's bad, where we are going to, are different. Our view in democracies is that people have the ballot box to decide whether their government is doing well or not for them. This is our rules. If people believe in the ballot box that governments are not doing well, the government is out. Now, the reality, why was Trump elected? Why did Brexit take place? Because people in the US or in the UK were very unhappy by the way they had been treated, notably after the 08 crisis. So we are back to this question of what makes people happy or unhappy, which is what they have the freedom to do in a democratic system, it's socio-economic problems. Governments have to be better at making people less unhappy so that a majority of them vote for them. Well, the World Bank delivered a report about uh, how much China has contributed to the world recovery, and over the past eight years, we have contributed 30%, 30% uh, for the global uh, economic dynamics. The issue is uh, um, emerging markets, along with China, uh, were initially expected to uh, contribute more uh, to the global growth. Look at uh, the agenda of the uh, BRICS summit in Brazil. Uh, our president, Mr. Xi Jinping, is there. So do you believe, uh, along with China, emerging markets will do their share? And uh, what do you think of the prospect of having, uh, you know, uh, more of a G20 role instead of a G7? G7 seems to be a part of history, right? Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, if there is an informal global governance forum, it's more the G20 than the G7. As far as your question is concerned, I mean, the world is powered, the world economy is powered half by developed countries and half by developing countries. And developing countries, emerging countries, growth is roughly the double of what it is in the developed world. So, let's take an average for the 10 years to come, 3.5%. And this is an average between 2% for developed world and 5% for the emerging world, including, of course, China, which is a big part of the emerging economies. Once again, the world is facing major transformation of uh, the industry through the use of digital technology and e-commerce, artificial intelligence, big data, uh, cloud computing. All of these help China to perhaps catch up more quickly. And do you think this is a more of an opportunity for the rest of the world? Or do you think uh, the issue of a 5G or Huawei threatens to divide 
uh, a world that is facing yet another wave of technological advances and transformation. This world is experiencing two major transformations. One is the one you just mentioned, digitalization, AI, IoT, uh, blockchain, and second, the energy transition, climate. Huh? This planet is in danger of not surviving the global warming which is happening. Now, on these two things, we are all in the same boat. On digitalization, it happens that the raw material of the digital economy is data. And that data regimes, data regulation, data ownership, data privacy, data localization, is not seen the same way in US, in Europe, and in China. The challenge is, how can we run successfully the digitalization of a market capitalist economy with three different data systems. On environment, there's no difference. We are exactly on the same boat. We know what decarbonizing our economies mean. And this is an area where, by the way, EU and China are working hand in hand and where we have a problem with the US exiting the Paris Agreement. The problem, Mr. Lamy, is uh, 5G comes across as a barrier from the American perspective that prevents uh, some of the Western countries from uh, being integrated into uh, a digital world. Uh, is it true that uh, Europeans would have to take side? Europeans, like others, do not like to be spied. And Likewise, Chinese don't like to be spied on. Uh, that's my point. Europeans need up-to-date 5G technology with the necessary assurances that they will not be spied, i.e. data stolen either by Americans or by Chinese, because these are the two main technology providers with a bit of Europe, because there are a few of them in Europe. So that's, that's, that's the situation. Um, I mean, being spied is, is not a nice thing for anybody, and I think it's right that Europeans take the necessary precautions to make sure that the core of their systems is, uh, uh, is shielded from foreign interference. Whatever the foreign comes from, and where I disagree with the US position, is that they make it a single way question. If I have a problem with Huawei, I also have a problem with Cisco. And if I have a problem with Cisco, I also have a problem with Huawei. I personally, I personally, I'm not an expert. I do not know how much in the depths of 5G networks can we allow either Cisco or Huawei. My advice would be take the necessary technical precautions. And that's it. It's not a political problem. It's just a problem of protecting the core of our systems. Again, vis-a-vis -vis any, any foreign interference. Thank you very much. My pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs> very good. What do you think of the differences you have with the United States on the issue of uh, trade protectionism? We disagree with uh, the actual position of the United States. We don't agree when Mr. Trump supports Brexit. We don't agree when uh, Mr. Trump uh, go out the agreement for Iran. Let's look at the, the BRICS summit. What do you think of their strong voice? We have to change to protect multilateralism. And we have to discuss with Greece, with ASEAN, with uh, the regional organization to develop a new vision of multilateralism. Dialogue, Your Excellency. Now, this uh, Paris Peace Forum, the second of its kind, addressed a number of pressing issues such as uh, uh, the uh, economic uh, slowdown, growing populism, uh, growing inequalities, particularly climate change. Now, 
What do you think are the most important issues for you on your agenda? I think the most important issue right now is uh, the meeting in October 2020 in Koenig, the COP15 about uh, biodiversity. We have this uh, negotiation and uh, in France we have uh, an experience about COP21 with the Paris Agreement and uh, we think that we can help China to success for this uh, diversity meeting in uh, October uh, 2020. What do you think of the differences you have with the United States on the issue of uh, trade protectionism and the reform of the WTO to safeguard the multilateralism and that's perhaps the position of the European Union. What's your observation about this issue? We disagree with uh, the actual position of the United States. Why? Because we are thinking that we need more cooperation than tensions. We need cooperation. And the only way against war is international cooperation. So we have to discuss how to develop the cooperation and uh, not uh, to have uh, such strategy like uh, unilateralism, protectionism, what uh, kind of uh, strategy which are not opening. We think that we have uh, to build together our future and uh, that's the reason why now we are uh, agree, for example, with China, but with uh, a lot of other countries to support multilateralism. Mm -hmm. But France is an ally of the United States. So there are many reasons for American policymakers that Paris should take side with the United States on critical issues such as uh, the reform of the WTO because they think China is no longer a developing country. The United States have, of course, historical alliances, but right now we have a lot of difficulties with the United States. We don't agree when Mr. Trump supports Brexit. We don't agree when uh, Mr. Trump uh, go out the agreement for Iran. We don't agree when Mr. Trump go out the agreement of Paris about climate change. So we have a lot of questions right now. So that's true, we have historical alliances, but right now we have a lot of points which are uh, very in opposition between Europe and United States. Is it somehow because of the return to the spirit of De Gaulle, the spirit of the Fifth Republic, you are going to be more independent in foreign affairs and in uh, uh, world economic issues? Yes, I think that um, Mr. Macron has a very right strategy about independence. We are able to talk with everybody. We talk with the United States. But uh, we are independent. And uh, to discuss with China, to discuss with Russia, we are independent. And uh, we are for a world uh, which is balanced. And we don't uh, want to have only one partner. And we disagree with trade war. We don't like war. We have known war in our country and we don't want war. Trade war, technological war, or military war. We don't want war, we don't want to have conflicts. We are in favor of cooperation. In the wake of a Brexit, France and Germany are likely to assume a continental leadership to ensure further regional and economic integration among EU 27. Now, do you see eye to eye with the Germans on all the major issues, such as, uh, say, uh, military spending, 
to strengthen the collective security of European Union. We are working with the new European Commission in this matter and we are hopeful that we will have agreement with uh, German. You know, uh, when Mr. Macron received President Xi Jinping in Paris in last March, he received with Mrs. Merkel and Mr. Juncker. And when he went to the Shanghai Expo, uh, he organized the day before the opening of the Expo, a meeting with French companies and with German companies. And uh, I think that uh, we are working between France and Germany to have an international common strategy. So we have a lot of work to do, but it's our strategy. And I think it's uh, possible to have agreement in such a matter you mentioned. All right. But President Macron came under fire for his remarks on the so-called brain death of the NATO when he was interviewed by The Economist. I agree with President Macron. I think uh, he's right. I think that uh, we can't have a partner who say to us, you pay and you don't decide. Let's look at the impact of uh, the growing far-right movement, like uh, the father and daughter of the Le Pen family. Do you believe the political landscape in most European countries is being quietly changed because of the negative influence of the far-right movement and populism? We are anxious about uh, the situation of uh, the radical rise in Europe, of course, yes. It's a very difficult question for us and uh, we need to uh, have a global strategy to have large majority and to develop uh, a, a policy uh, which is able to gather the people. That's the reason why in France Macron has some supporters from the right and from the left, all against uh, the radical right. Let's look at the the BRICS summit. Now, almost at the same time uh, when the Paris Peace Forum uh, was ta is taking place, we have the BRICS summit in Brazil. France is a developed country, but the idea of G7, I'm afraid, is a little bit outdated compared with uh, the growing importance of G20 in the wake of the financial meltdown back in the year 2008. Emerging markets, particularly BRICS, as a novel idea seems to be gaining momentum in shaping the economic landscape in reforming the multilateral mechanisms such as WTO and the United Nations, World Bank and IMF. What do you think of their strong voice? I think it's important to protect but to change multilateralism. And uh, we think that uh, Multilateralism right now is 75 years old. And when we think to the United Nations, for example, uh, Africa was not what is Africa right now. China, Asia was not what they are now. So we have to change to protect multilateralism. And we have to discuss with BRICS, with ASEAN, with uh, the regional organization to develop a new vision of multilateralism. It's very important to have this new vision. Eh? We are very open. We want to protect multilateralism. We don't support unilateralism. We don't support protectionism. So we have to discuss and to listen new country, new emerging country, which were not there 75 years ago. And we need to have this uh, dialogue with new countries, change to protect. This year marks the 55th anniversary of the bilateral relationship 
thanks to the spirit of independence of uh, Mr. de Gaulle. What do you think of uh, the importance of a rising China for the world? You know what China has done in the 40 uh, last years is uh, amazing. It's a very uh, high level performance. Now China is in the same position than two centuries ago. Uh, two centuries ago she was very strong in the world. So I think that uh, we need China. We need China for finance, for the balance of the financing world. We need China for the growth. We need China for technology, a lot of case. And uh, we need Chinese project, Belt and Road Initiative, for example. We need this matter. But the question now is uh, the strongness of China. And when you are very strong, some people are afraid about your strategy, your development. So you have to take care of what people in the world are thinking about you. And I think that uh, the discussion, uh, the meeting between uh, Xi Jinping and Macron was very useful in Shanghai uh, for the big expo. And I think that uh, we need China. We want that China uh, participe to this new multilateralism with this idea, but it's necessary that uh, the strongness of China take care of the other in China and in Europe that we need cooperation. Maybe we disagree about some question, but we need China and we need to discuss with China. So that's the reason why in this world we are in favor of cooperation and we don't like this question of trade war. We don't like it. Thank you very much, Mr. Raffran.